I often say it's a kind design. You realize that there's a force at play here and we're here on earth for certain reasons, mostly to learn, it seems like, but that this will be over at some point and that's just the way it's designed. I'd like to welcome to the show, William Peters. How are you doing, William? Hey, good to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm excited to talk to you about uh, your new book at Heaven's Door and uh, everything inside and, and your journey, which is a fairly interesting uh, take on the near death or it, it just the, the, the afterlife in general. It's a very interesting take on it. So how did your spiritual journey begin, sir? Well, I, you know, I think it began at 17 years old uh, when I had my first near-death experience. I mean, I was living a pretty standard life for a suburban kid in, in uh, you know, San Francisco area, basically. And, you know, skiing on the Squaw Valley Mountain, a really well-known ski resort outside Lake Tahoe. And it took a very bad fall and fractured my spine oh, wow. and on impact. And, and then what I remember is that everything went dark right away, but I still had an observing self. You know, it wasn't an ego. I don't think it was just observing consciousness. Things were dark, but I was just watching this. I wasn't the least bit worried. And then I started moving away from uh, my body. Uh, I could see my body on the ski slopes. Things started to lighten up at that point. I had the, you know, the light came back on, if you will. Uh, I could see the ski area, Lake Tahoe, then, you know, Colorado Rockies, continental US, and I was moving quickly away, enamored by the whole experience, you know, no pain, like I said. And then as I was taken up in the, in the beauty of it all, I was watching a life review that was of my life up to the first 17 years of my life that was being played back to me really in the background. I mean, I was kind of, you know, there's multiple things happening, but I was enjoying looking at the galaxy uh, just at peace, really like I said, enthralled. And then I noticed this whole life review was going on and I was, I, my attention focused on that. And I was like, wow, there, 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 there's, this is my whole life in detail and focusing on how my actions in particular, influenced other people. So it was a real lesson in karma and not a, not a pleasant lesson either because the things that really stuck out was, you know, the times when I was unkind or selfish or mean or what have you. Uh, and I learned that everything matters. Uh, and so in the, as I was going through that, at some point, once again, all this thing, stuff happened simultaneously. I then found myself in this tunnel of sorts and in the distance I could see a light and at first, the light didn't mean a whole lot to me. But then as I got closer to the light, it got, you know, not that much closer. I was still pretty far. I realized, oh, boy, I'm dying. And then I, then I had a whole nother download of realizations, which is I've been here before. And I, and I was, and not just once or twice, like, I think hundreds, maybe thousands of times. So it was very familiar to me. And I was, then I felt emotion uh, arise within me that expressed, I don't want to die. I didn't complete what I came to this incarnation to do. I don't want to die. At that point, I was uh, pleading with God, if you will, because I grew up Catholic. As I looked at the light, it was clear to me that that's where the power was. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it, was a, it was a lovely, you know, suasive, if you will, alluring, um, pulsating light and I was just seeing a piece of it. By no way would I claim that I saw the whole thing. You know, I, I'm, I could just say, oh, my gosh, I'm just getting a sense for this light. And this thing's enormous. Uh, and so finally, I'm in the light. And I'm stopped in the light. And I'm more blissed out and comfortable in a certain way. But I'm still agitated in, in another way. Like, I want to go back. You got, I can't, I can't leave this life. I don't. I've already done 17 years. I don't want to go back and do another childhood. It's like, you know, I was kind of really working it in my mind. And it's in some really specific details about what I did and did not want. So I don't know how long I was up there pleading, but it, it wasn't that long. And I felt a, then I felt a gentle push on my, on my bean, if you will. 
And I started heading back. At first, I just thought I was being pushed out of the light. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. Uh, then he, then that, that, that light, God, if you will, said, uh, make something of your life. And that was it. And it was a very solemn, direct, clear message, you know, and, and I got, and it kind of shook me up, like make something of my life. What does that mean? And then I started moving back, uh, you know, kind of moving back towards at that point, I didn't know what I was moving towards, except I had a sense that, Oh, I am going back. And I, as I turned my vision away from the light and started looking back to where I thought was earth, I could see nothing. I mean, I was just gazing into a beautiful galaxy. There was no earth in sight. Uh, but I realized I was being pulled along in some way, uh, guided. There was a more of an energetic feeling of gravitational pull. And I just went with it. And somebody realized, oh, there's some, there's some, some force guiding this. So eventually I could see planet earth and then, you know, ski area. And I landed in my body and uh, I remember when I landed in my body, I felt the coldness of the snow because I was covered in snow on my back and but I had no feeling in my body. And then I screamed one last time. I don't know if it was an, it was, must've been an internal scream. I think I know now as I think about it, it was an internal scream, you know, um, don't let me be paralyzed. God, don't let me be paralyzed. And, and then I felt feeling come back into my body from the extremities first, like from my feet and toes and fingers. And they just got to move back into the center of my body. I can't remember if it was that way or the other way. Anyway, but it was like moving across my body. Um, like you're under a warm shower, mm -hmm. that type of sensation. And I didn't think of, after that, I came, you know, got back in my body and then, I opened my eyes. Um, I was covered in snow. My friend John came up to me, said, wow, that was a wipeout. And I forgot about the experience for a decade. Really? Yeah, I just didn't. I mean, I think I remembered in dreams uh, and such. I know I did. I know I remembered it in dreams and went back. In fact, the first few nights afterwards, I was dreaming quite a bit about it. And uh, But I didn't, you know, 17-year-old kid you know partying and you know athlete you know i was an athlete and that's that was my first you know what i would call um spiritual experience in a, in a really in a, in a personal way uh, i mean i have those religious experiences and things like that you know when you i w grew up catholic and you know i i wouldn't say that i had a particular calling to uh, at that time to you know roman catholic um, spirituality in a certain way. I was more like, I liked the goodness, the morals they taught. I mean, that, 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 were, that they were being taught, but I didn't have any spiritual experiences per se. That was the really, the first one. I didn't even know what to do with it. In fact, I wouldn't even call it a spiritual experience until over a decade later. I didn't even know I had it until uh, I actually had a second near-death experience in 20, when was it? I must've been 13 years after yeah, it was 1992. I was 30 years old. Yeah. And uh, that was just an ICU experience, blood imbalance, idiopathic thrombocytopenia, you know, kind of a hemophiliac condition. And I went into the ER and they immediately did a blood test, put a fall alert on me. And next thing I know, I wake up and I'm on top of a ceiling somewhere. Now, I know it's an ICU. Once again, I am this observing consciousness um whatever with no no connection to any to me or to anyone i'm just roaming around the ceiling of the icu kaiser oakland hospital and no identity until the nurses are talking about the various patients and they mention this guy in bed three who's 30 years old, super healthy, no known history, you know, uh, we don't know what he's doing here, what he, you know, and we don't know how he got here. You know, the doctor's coming in a little bit later to check him out, the expert from UCSF, that's the medical center. And, and I'm just watching, I, just, I think at some point I just roll, move, my, move myself, because I can move myself, my consciousness. I, I look over at that body and I go, oh my gosh, that's, that's me. You know, and and I, and, but that didn't really catch my attention for very long either. Like I just kind of remember saying, "Okay, that's me." But then I went around roving, and because I was much more curious about 
uh, being on the on the tenth floor of the in, in the ICU of Kaiser. I, mean, I just remember moving down the halls and just kind of checking things out, and that was it. Uh, oh, the doctor came in. That's one other thing. This was interesting. So when the doctor came in, the hematologist, he approached me and uh, or he approached my physical body. He tapped on my hand and said, Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters. And I remember that getting my attention, but I didn't feel it. I was above my body and I was looking down at the top of his head and at my body. Uh, and, and then I had this question, well, do I answer him? Do I not answer him? What if I do answer him? What will happen? And I thought to myself, well, I'll just answer him and see what happens. And so I just said, yeah. So I was very slow. Yes. And as I said, yes, I started filling in my body energetically. It was a similar experience to being on that ski slope, you know, where all of a sudden the energy moved across my body. And then I opened my eyes and then my whole perception, uh, my perception field changed in the sense that now I was looking up at the doctor from, as opposed to looking on top of his, uh, him from on top and seeing his crown. And that was that, you know, and then we had a conversation. So those are, those are two early experiences uh, of, of that really um, awakened me to these experiences of being out of body, uh, having a sense of self and consciousness that exists uh, independent of the physical body and a whole host of other phenomena as you've heard already. So now to, to fast forward to the subject of my book and my research um, on the shared death experience. Well, when I went to work in hospice, I started having these experiences and that is someone is dying and I would pop out of my body and I would be with them. This happened a few times, but one in particular, I actually, it was what I call my gateway experience into my own uh, shared death experience. I'm at the bedside of this gentleman, Ron, we'll call him in the book he's referred to as Ron and he's dying and but he's unresponsive so he's been in what we call you know unresponsive semi comatose state so but i was always reading to him stories he loved these jack london adventure stories and so i would read to him these stories on a regular basis and on this afternoon i was reading to him and once again to be really clear he was just almost like sleeping on the bed and looked at, to be at peace and i found myself suspended above my body, looking down at my body. I was still reading. I didn't stop reading. And, and I could see myself reading. And I looked over at Ron in his bed, and he was prone, no changes. But then I looked to my right, and there's Ron. And Ron's got a big face. Now, it's not Ron's full body. He's got his big face. His eyes are open. He's smiling. He's, at, he's blissed out as if to say to me, hey, you know, check this out, William. Check this out. So I feel like he kind of invited me there in a certain way. I can't explain how that happens. But this is this is kind of one of the shared death phenomena uh, where it's called the co-experienced out of body. Now, for your viewers, listeners who are familiar with the near-death experience, the, the out-of-body experience, OBE, is very well known and studied. In the shared death experience, it, it, it happens as well, but it's typically a, a co-experience. In other words, you're typically with the dying or, um, yeah, and when we, I distinguish out-of-body experiences from, other, from being in other heavenly realms or visionary realms. So this is the OBE in my, you know, in my definition happens right in the human realm, typically in the room or nearby where the dying exists uh, or, or where they exist and where they last existed, I guess is the way to say it. And then, uh, but when you go beyond that into another uh, realm, that, that then becomes uh, visionary heavenly realms and, yeah. So I hope that's a good introduction. I, I should say the definition of the shared death experience is this. Somebody dies and a loved one, caregiver or bystander reports that they feel like they shared in the transition from this human existence into a benevolent afterlife with the dying. So they feel like they witness in this journey uh, with the dying. And that's a dominant motif is that there's a journey going on. There's 
the dot, the spirit, soul, consciousness, however you want to call it, of the dying, begins this journey out of the physical body and begins moving into another dimension. And the shared death experiencer is able to participate in that, observe it, and, and, and see a lot of the phenomena uh, that, that presumably they're experiencing. And the phenomena are almost identical to the near-death experience, except the perception is from a different angle. Yeah, you're, you're a bystander. You're an audience member. There you go. Perfect. Exact. So was Ron your first one in the shared? Um, Ron was... Ron was not my first one, I should say. So what happened uh, on that very first one? Because I'm assuming you freaked out a bit. Well, you know, this is a great question. So I, I, after I had my first near-death experience, I went on to college the following, you know, four years or such. And after college, well, let me just share this. This is kind of interesting. So between my junior and senior years in college, I went to Europe as so many college students do. In those days, it was so economical, uh, especially the way we traveled. It was like, you know, we ever had a Let's Go Europe book and $10 a day. And it was <laughs> your, your, your rail pass and you were like trouble. So, um, and so I remember being in Greece with two of my buddies I was traveling with. And we wanted to go up beyond the Iron Curtain. We wanted to go to Budapest and East Berlin and da da da. But the quickest way on the map was to go through what was Yugoslavia. But that was beyond the Iron Curtain, and there was no information on Yugoslavia. It was like it was just like a blank on the map. So no one was really going there, even though, as we know, Dubrovnik is one of the most beautiful tourist areas in the world. So, um, but the reason I'm sharing this is I just decided we just decided to take a bus ride up to Dubrovnik because we knew Dubrovnik was cool, but there was no information on how to get there. So we just found buses and just trusted we'd be able to work it out. Uh, took off from Greece, from Athens, and just started heading north along the coast. Uh, and then, you know, so those who know the, the geography is you had to skirt Albania and all the rest of it. But we woke up, I woke up on an overnight bus ride. And you know how that is when you're waking up, you have that you're kind of, there's a, it's a liminal state, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I have a lot of visions and mm -hmm. uh, just a lot of good stuff happens psychically. It's just as I'm waking up. And as I woke up, I pulled back the window, the drapes on the windows. I was really groggy and I looked out and I saw really, we were on a plaza and I know this is Bosnia. Now I did the, I know where it was, it was in Bosnia somewhere. So a Muslim uh, culture. As I looked out, all I could see was women, the uh, dark eyes of women with their burqas on mm -hmm. and their hands like this begging. Now, I know I grew up in, you know, suburban uh, California. I had never seen that sincerity, authenticity, and raw expression of need and desperation. These were, these were young women. Most of them had babies on their backs. And I was just blown away. I started weeping as I looked out that window. And in that moment, I realized something. Now, I should say, I was suffering from chronic pain from the back injury. So I was looking kind of normal, but I was hiding the fact that I was in intense back pain. Um, but it wasn't willing to own it. It wasn't willing to slow down my life. And so uh, the looking in the eyes of, you know, these women, I, I made a commitment to myself that the people like this, these people had something to teach me. Like I needed to learn. And I don't know where that came from, but I made a commitment to myself that I'm going to work with underprivileged people who are living close to the edge in poverty. Okay. Fast forward after college, um, I, you know, I ended up, I went to a Catholic prep school in Silicon Valley and I called up uh, one of my teachers, a, a Jesuit priest. And I said, listen, this is my, what I'm feeling like I want to do. And he was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, I'm going to put you in touch with a Jesuit international volunteer organization. So I end up working in 
uh, Belize, Central America is my first job working, you know, teaching the city, which at that time was a very poor city. It still is actually. But at that time, there was only, you know, one stoplight, a couple paved roads. It was, it was, you know, it was poor. And then after that, I went down to Guatemala and then I ended up in, in Peru. And so I ended up spending, you know, a couple of years in Peru, almost a year and a half in Peru. And one evening, so I was working with Center for Working Children, working with very, very, uh, you know, people on the edges. It was There was a civil war going on. There were refugees all in our town all from coming down from the war torn areas of the highlands. And we would go, we would, as a group, try to get out to the beach. We were about 50 minutes inland on a, a car ride. Try to get out to the beach, you know, during the summertime there every now and then. And on this Sunday afternoon, we're driving back from the beach and it's hot, hot in the Atacama desert, you know, in summertime. And we're on the pavement, you know, well, when as we're driving on this two lane road, it must, I don't know, seven, eight o'clock at night. And we see, see something on the road. And as we're approaching it, uh, we finally realize that's a, that's a human body. And, you know, the, we had a couple of Peruvian people in the car and they said, don't stop, don't stop. If the police come, they'll blame you for it. And, you know, you take you to jail, da, da, da. And I said, no, we're stopping. I said, no, we're stopping. And so I got out of the car and I walked over to the body. Of course, I didn't know what I was walking up to really. And I uh, could see that it was a peasant in Spanish, a campesino, you know, a, a, a man of the, of the field, a man of the land. This was an agrarian worker. Um, and he was in his Sunday best too, uh, because they work six days a week. And, but he, so it seemed like he'd been perhaps struck by a car. Uh, I turned, you know, and I turned him over, he was face down, I turned him over and I realized uh, that he did not have alcohol in his breath. So this wasn't a belligerent, you know, this wasn't, there wasn't recklessness here. So I don't, I, you know, I was kind of trying to figure out if he's safe or not. And I, and at that time I took his pulse and realized that he had a very slight pulse um, but he wasn't breathing. So I started mouth to mouth with him right there. And then the car pulled up, but we had a wagon ear. And so, and so um, as we were doing that, uh, as I was doing that, um, all of a sudden I felt just with the first breath after that, all of a sudden my world got really tunnel visioned. And this is something that happens in the shared death experience. We call this the change in the time space continuum. All of a sudden my vision got narrow. My sensory field got really big. um, And I started feeling presences. Like all of a sudden I felt like, Oh, there's some, something here. Now I wasn't registering it like, like I would today because now I have these frequently and um, I know the phenomena. But in that day I was like, wow, this is interesting. And it was very sublime. It was like, okay. And I got the sense that you're doing the right thing. Like all of a sudden I got this sense of guidance, like, yes, do this. There was clarity. There was focus. There was guidance. I can't say that I felt specific beings or angels. No, I couldn't say that. I could say that there was presences around, um, undifferentiated that I was feeling. And, and so I continued to CPR, put him in the back of the, of the um, Wagoneer. We took him to the hospital and I felt like I was in this altered state during this entire experience. We finally dropped him off at the hospital. I walked to, you know, we, you know, and they said they would take care of him. Um, and I said, I come back the next day. They said, you could give blood the next day. And I felt this incredible uh, um, connection with this campesino. And it was just weird. And I, the connection, I believe, came because of this deep spiritual experience that we had shared together in a certain way. He's completely unconscious. So that would be my first one uh, of that sense of well, there's something happening here. Now, as he would, I would come back the next subsequent two days, they did tell me that he had, you know, severe brain damage and that would not be coming. If he did come back, he would not be normal. Um, And then he died a couple of days later. 
And, and then I came when I realized that he had died. I came in the morning at uh, two days later and they said he died you know, earlier this morning. And then when I heard that, I went out into the courtyard uh, in the hospital. It was a clear blue day. I'll never, you know, just, of course, in the desert, they're all that way. But it was just clear and warm summertime. I just sat down on the bench and I started weeping. I don't even know why. And then again, those presences came back. And I got this sense of this real guidance of like, thank you. Thank you. You, 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 you did well, or you, you just did what you were supposed to do. It was, those not like anything like, you know, holding you up as a saint. It was just like, thank you for caring. And, and that felt like as good as I've felt in my life, really. Like I was doing what I came here to do. It felt right. Da, da. Anyway, so that's my first shared death experience. And then the one at the hospice was the beginning of another round of these that would be much clearer in a certain way. Like I, you know, I would having out of body experiences, changing the geometry of the room, light changes. Um, you know, I, I didn't have very many life reviews with people. I didn't visit very many. I don't can't remember visiting, you know, heavenly realms as uh, I did, you know, later in other uh, times. <clears throat> but and the, but but the definitely the working at hospice at Zen Hospice in San Francisco for two plus years that I did uh, with dying people all the time. That really put me in touch with these experiences. Now, at the time, there was no name for this experience. And I would share, I shared it once with my supervisor, who I thought the world of, and he didn't have a name for it either. He didn't even really want to hear it. I wouldn't, not, not, not that he didn't want to hear it. He just didn't think it was that important. He just kind of said, you know, continue the work, you know, there's a lot of people need your help here. Um, so, so yeah, it wasn't until 2009 when I heard Raymond Moody uh, speak about the shared death experience at a conference where I just lit up like a Christmas tree and said, oh my God, there's a name for this. I had no idea. So I talked to Raymond about it and Raymond has become a, you know, a really it's a sweet, sweet man, sweet man, really supportive of the work. In fact, Raymond and I are teaching a course right now together on the shared death experience. And um, at that time, he just looked at me and just was all affirming, just said, William, if you think you can do research on this and know how about to do that, he goes, that's great, because there's been no research done to date. And we do know that these experiences exist in the literature, just, you know, in disparate places under different names. But I, I'll, I'll support you and best I can. And so he did. I mean, he he provided some guidance initially and had him come out to Santa Barbara to raise money for the research project. and. And as it turned out, you know, I started teaching about shared death experiences and found that they were ubiquitous. People are having these things right and left. They don't know a name for it. Uh, hospital staff typically doesn't know about them, doesn't really know what to do with them, seems to suggest that people may be having grief, uh, grief hallucinations. Um, now, the seasoned hosp hospice workers, uh, you know, like Maggie Callanan, who wrote Final Gifts, a great a book on nearing death awareness. Uh, she was well aware of this. In fact, she wrote, uh, you know, an endorsement on my book because she thinks that this experience is one that's going to like her work is, is going to um, revolutionize end of life care. Because when people know that these experiences exist and that you can have them and you can prepare for them, you can enable them in a certain way, people are going to want them. And, and it's going to change end of life care. Uh, so, so that's how we got started. And I can go on more and more, but I've been going for a bit here. So, <laughs> so no, that's, that's fascinating. When, so when you're in the hospice room and you had these shared death experiences, are you kind of a guide or does the person that is dying know what's going on? Are you there to help them along? Sometimes they're just smiling at you. Like what, what's the, what is your place here? What, what, what is your purpose during that process? You know, this is a, that's a very insightful question because that's one of the, um, one of the questions I was asking early on was what, 
not just what's the purpose of this, that was another question, but what are the different ways in which the experiencer, the shared death experiencer can participate in this shared death experience? And like, what's their role? Like, what, like what's going on here? Like, so to, to boil it down to the low gravy, as they say in the South, um, there are four modes of participation. The first mode is sensing at a distance. Now you're going to say sensing at a distance. What does that mean? Well, yeah, the one of the fascinating aspects to the shared death experience is you don't have to be a bedside. Two thirds of shared death experiences, four, uh, 64% happen remotely. That means down the hall, uh, across town, or across the world. Time does time and space in a certain way. Space certainly doesn't make a difference. Time makes a difference, presumably, but in 25% of our cases, they don't happen at the time of death. They happen, you know, an hour before or later, what have you. So the first first way to experience a shared death experience is through sensing at a distance. So sensing at a distance would be something like you feel chills and you cross your body. You then think about a good friend of yours or a loved one, and you have this kind of arrest in your heart and you're like, something just happened to John. Like, oh my God, something just, I got to call John. I got to call John. And, and there's different ways you can have that. So um, the other way is you could be, you know, down the hall of in you know your house and someone dies and you could see that person in your and what feels like a dream but it's really a vision and they've come to you and said i'm okay just want you to know i'm okay and they're gone uh these are sensing at a distance um so the next one is a witnessing or observing what we call death related phenomena which is basically near death phenomena so you see you know, ch- change in the time space continuum is the first one. You know, you get disoriented, the room changes shapes, all that. Uh, you see the light in a different way. The light may be cascading. Um, you know, by the way, the cha- time, change in the time space continuum can be pretty freaky in the sense that walls can fall down. Um, ceiling goes away. You're looking into the heavens. These are big. These are not just, uh, you know, a little disorientation in your view. It starts that way, but it tends to lead into other phenomena like the ceiling goes away and all of a sudden you feel like you're in a galaxy. You're no longer in the human realm. So that's, you know, heavenly realms. Uh, You'll see deceased uh, relatives. Uh, You'll see the dying. The most common entity you see in the shared death experience is the dying. 51% of our cases, we they report seeing the dying. Uh, 16% of the time, you'll see an elevated spirit being, if you will, angel, guide, elevated, wise, ascended, something or other, that is often called, uh, I've named the term in some of these, they call, I refer to it as the conductor. There seems to be this force that is guiding the whole transition for the dying. And they, oftentimes it's an angel, light being, whatever. And, and it's recognized as this, this entity is in charge of this. Uh, the, the third type of entity you see is deceased relative friend of the dying. And that's 13% of the time. So those are some of the main phenomena. I guess the other one that matches up pretty closely with the near-death experiences, you're going along as a shared death experience, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is as far as I can go. So maybe there's a welcoming party that you see that the dying is going into, and you know it's all jovial, and you're, you're blissed out and happy, and all of a sudden you realize, oh. I can't go to that party. <laughs> yeah, security is going to stop me. Yeah, exactly. There's a bouncer and you're about to get bounced. And then when that happens, once you realize that, you are instantly back in your body. I mean, and that when that, when you hit that boundary, it's over. Um, and then they're back, you're literally back in the human body. So that's all witnessing unusual ph- phenomena uh, related to death. That's the second type of mode of participation. The third type is... Uh, accompanying. So that means you actually are with the dying and you are moving along in this journey from the human life into the afterlife and typically seeing all the phenomena I've described and moving towards the light, the light serving as the ultimate destination, at least for what we can tell. Now, we know there's something beyond that, but in terms of the bounds of the shared death experience, we know of nobody who's gone into the light and gone past the light. 
We know people have gone into the light, stopped, and that's it. They typically don't go as far into the light as NDE experiencers. They tend to get up close to the light, uh, maybe close to the light, maybe not. A lot of times they don't even get close to the light. See the light in the distance and that's it. Uh, so so that's, that's accompanying. But in some cases, a very small percentage, 6%, but quite significant, especially when you hear the experience, the experiencer expresses that they were called into the experience in some way they don't quite understand. And their role was to assist the dying in the transition, typically about orienting them as to where they are in their journey. And, and it begins with, hey, you know, you've died. And then, you know, you're confused. You might want to turn towards the light. And by the way, there's some spirit guides up here that can help you. And then you move along with them to orient them. And then at some point you've done your job. You typically hand off the dying to some elevated beings, deceased relatives, and you're done and you hit the boundary and you're back. But that's the fourth mode of participation, namely assisting or guiding the dying. That's fascinating because uh, I mean, after talking to so many near death experiencers, there is a disorientation um, uh, there's a remembering of like who you truly are. Like you've been wearing this suit for so long. You forgot what it's like without the suit and you forgot where you even came from, what you really are and all this stuff. And there is that kind of uh, remembering. And that's why they're there. You're like, no, no, come this way. Kind of like you're hazy. Like you just woke up and you're just yeah. like, what's going on, what's happening. And then you need, so sometimes the, the share death experiencer is there to, act as a guide as well, which is fascinating. It's really, truly fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, the whole experience is like a near-death experience. But what's so interesting is there's no trauma. There's no... For, for, for the shared, for the, the person doing the sharing. Yeah. For the shared death experiencer, there's like in a near-death experience, you have to have a brush with death. <laughs> right. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What are um, what are the, the the major benefits that um, that shared death experiencers have when they come back into their body? Because I'm assuming how many have, how many have the, have you had in, in in your life? I've probably had a couple dozen. Okay, so you've had a couple dozen. So, mm-hmm. do you have the same benefits that do you get the same benefits that a near death experiencer gets? Those kind of um, uh, what are they called? The the after effects, some major after effects. Very similar. Let me go through them um, with you. So the the primary after effect, which is obviously different than the SDE, but I'll start with than the NDE, but I'll start with it, and that is a sense that your departed deceased loved one is alive and well and content in a benevolent afterlife. That's the first one you get. The second one that is shared along with the SDE is the NDE is that, well, you know that you survive human death and you exist in a benevolent realm call it heaven, call it what you want, an afterlife. So there's that one. Your fear of death and dying, well, I should say of death, is alleviated. Um, Dying itself is still, uh, can be difficult. But death, yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) But death itself, no no fear there. Um, Your grief is radically different in a shared death experience because you have a sense that your loved one, while you grieve them, you miss them. Um, as you naturally would, you have a larger context to hold the light, the loss in. You realize that there's something bigger going on here and that this human existence exists inside a larger um, ultimate reality. Uh, and the, four, the, the, the fifth after effect, if I've got them numbered out correctly, is that you have a renewed understanding for the purpose of a human life, both generally and specific to you. So people will come back and say, I've got to, I I know I'm here for a short period of time. This life has purpose and meaning. I got to get about doing it and living it out. So that looks like people often change relationships, change professions, you know, make big life decisions. 
and that that's what they feel like they're called to do. And most people, if you talk to them many years later, are very grateful for those changes and attribute it to the to their shared death experience. And they also do they also come back more empathetic, more kind, more aware of how their actions affects other people and so on? Uh, I think there's some affective. Well, that, that would be that's a good question. I, you know, there is a there is some data that suggests um, that they come back with psychic abilities or, or other gifts, intuitive gifts. What we do know is this, is that when you have one SDE, you're likely to have more. And like 41% of the people and are now over 250 interviewees uh, or participants in our research have had more than one. So that tells you something. Mm -hmm. So there's some sort of what I would call wiring or software, if you want to be a little, um, you know, use that metaphor, um, that allows you to be receptive and um, capable of having more of these experiences. And, you know, they're highly desirable. So uh, people don't shy away from them if they, you know, a lot of us get into end of life work um, and, la- and, and, and it's not all of us, but some of us, because we want to be around death and dying because it's a gateway to these experiences. Um, and it also gets, it also gives you a much clearer understanding of dying because it's something that we oh. all eventually rich or poor, <laughs> big or small. We all go, we all start off the same way. We all end the same way. That's correct. Yeah. At the, so you become much more, uh, you're like you said, less afraid of death. It's not this boogeyman. It's not the guy with the sickle uh, sitting there waiting for you. It's not a negative thing. It's like, it's part of the process. Just like there is a winter and a summer and a spring and a fall. There are these seasons within a life. And at the end, it's just part of, as, as, uh, as they say in the Lion King, it's the circle of life. (laughs) It is, it is. And I, I think you said it really well there because um, there is an acceptance and a receptivity and a, and a peace, mm-hmm. a real peace about this is the way it goes and it's all good. And it's, and that, you know, I often say it's a kind design. You realize that there's a force at play here and we're here on earth for certain reasons, mostly to learn, it seems like, but that, this will be over at some point. And that's just the way it's designed. And it's, it's yeah. just like, it's like a movie. I mean, a good movie is a good movie, but there's still an end. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> there's still an end as much as you want to live in that world. And I've seen movies that I've just been enthralled with the, inv- the world and the characters and the, and the, the universe that they live in that you want to live there. But at the end of the day, the movie has to, the, the end comes up. So it is a process yeah. on, on, of everything that we do. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pre-death premonitions? Oh, yeah. So, um, so when I, let me give you some history on this. When I started, after I met Raymond Moody, I poured myself into research on uh, shared death experiences that came up under a variety of different names. Primarily the London Society for Psychical Research had done a good deal of research in the late 1800s. And uh, Sir William Barrett, also of the Society for Psychical Research, published a book called Deathbed Visions in 1926. And he had like 57 or so accounts, about 17% of them were SDE, shared death experiences. I, you know, I read through all of them and, you know, it, the language is a little anachronistic. So I had to, you know, and partial details. So, but in that, I realized there were a lot of phenomena. Now, what's interesting is these researchers called most of this phenomena generally was fell under the general category of uh, apparitions at death, <laughs> apparitions mm-hmm. at death. So that's very, that's very wide um, definition, if you will. But as I was doing this, people would come, I would be interviewing, and I had a big clinical practice. Still, I still see people clinically, but now I'm more of a researcher and presenter and teacher and what have you. Um, but in the days when I was seeing lots of people and put out, you know, told people I was interested, my colleagues knew about it, I was getting all sorts of people with, with a 
lots of different phenomena. So I don't know if I had a shared death experience, William, but I had this experience. And I, so I created through this clinical work, my own map to make sense of what these variety of end of life experiences were. And I called it the spectrum of end of life experiences. And it began with, to answer your question, pre-death premonitions. So the first phenomena that I often heard was, well, this is going to sound strange, William, but I know I'm here to talk about the death of my father. And I did have a shared death experience with him and da, da, da. But something else I want to share with you is that about three months before he died, and you remember, he didn't have any symptoms. He was perfectly healthy. I had this vision of my father dying suddenly and me being there to comfort him in his final moments. And he said, it was just the most bizarre and scary vision. It was more real than real. Like I, I it was not a dream, William, it was happening. And I thought, okay. And he said, then, then he, this gentleman says to me, and when he died and I got word of it, it felt exactly the same way. Like I had a precognitive experience that told me exactly how my father was going to die, what my relationship was going to be to it, and prepare me for how I was going to feel. That's a pre-death premonition right there. And that means essentially that you have knowledge of someone's death or your own death before it actually happens. And pre-death premonitions can happen, you know, many years in advance, but the bulk of them happen within a year or so, months out in advance. And you'll see, if you're observant, you might see people uh, exhibiting different behaviors. So one thing I like, I've often noticed, and I saw this in my research as well, continue to see it, is, you know, I'm in a university town here, and I remember a, uh, a wife of a professor coming to me and saying, this is for grief and bereavement counseling, her husband, professor, had died. She came to me and she said, the strangest thing happened three months ago, just before he died. So he was an absent-minded professor. He was fanatical about what he did. He always had books and papers strewn all over the place. But all of a sudden, he started cleaning his desk. He started organizing his notes and, and returning books to colleagues and writing notes saying, thank you for this and that. And, and he, he actually did something I thought was really strange. He kind of was preparing for a sabbatical, but he didn't really have a sabbatical coming up. Hmm. And she said, and she says, I look, as I look back at it now, I think he knew he was going to die at some level. Now, this is fascinating because I said, did, did he ever tell you that, um, that he thought something was going to happen? No, he never mentioned it. But the reason why I share this is because I think there are levels of knowing, there are levels of awareness. Sometimes you have a dream or a vision or an experience that lets you know this is a precognitive event that's preparing you, informing you that someone, you, you or someone you know is going to die. And sometimes it impacts you below your consciousness as it did with this professor. Um, because you know, by the time he died, uh, he literally said to her, like a few, like a few, he died tragically too, suddenly. But, um, but he, she said a few weeks before he died, he said, you know, by the way, you know, I just want to let you know, the estate plan is here as we discussed. And, you know, she's like, what are you telling me all this for? And he goes, well, you know, I just, you know, you know, we're not young, you know, but he didn't, he didn't connect it up to like, I'm dying, but he had some intuitive sensory guidance to, let him know something was happening. Clean, clean up your, clean up your business. Clean up your business. Yeah. Clean up your business. Um, you, you've used a term before called terminal lucid, uh, lucid, lucidity. Terminal lucidity. Yeah. Lucidity. Yeah. What yeah. is that? Um, so that terminal lucidity is that's also on our spectrum of end of life experiences. Um, and let me just go through the spectrum really quick. So the spectrum is pre-death premonitions. Like I said, a few months, a year or two in advance. <laughs> Pre-death uh, pre synchronicities happen as well. Those are things like, um, you know, you just see these synchronistic events, like all of a sudden, 
the, um, you know, birds will be circling around your house, black crows or something moments before the death of somebody. And you're like, what is that all about? And they're like, like I've, never, I've seen crows, but never like that. And the crows are gathering and you're like, and all of a sudden your grandfather dies. Okay. So that's a pre-death synchronicity. By the way, synchronicities happen throughout death and dying processes, you know, before, during, after. Um, there's pre-death visions and visitations. That's uh, when the dying and caregivers as well, but primarily dying, report seeing deceased relatives who've come to say, hey, get your affairs ready. We're, we're coming for you. Don't worry about it. It's all being managed. And then there's this terminal lucidity, uh, which we'll come back to in a second, but I'll define it now, which is this unexplainable physiological capability that is not possible given the medical condition that you're in, and yet you exhibit these physiological behaviors, whether it's whether you have Alzheimer's and all of a sudden you have acute, uh, sharp, accurate cognition. Uh, you know, we see hear about this all the time. Persons with Alzheimer's come to, they're alert, and they, they talk to their people along the bed, around the bed and telling them, asking them questions that are pertinent to their current life, even things that happened in the last few days. And everyone's like, well, she's been comatose and semi-conscious for months, if not years. How did she know to ask me about this? I never told her about it. So that's terminal lucidity. You also see that physical expression as well. So blind people see, um, you know, people that have been crippled or bedridden, get up and move around their bed. Yeah. Isn't it like what um, I heard Steve Jobs and Betty White both had something yes. similar at the end? Very well. Those are great uh, popular figures. So Steve White, excuse me, Steve White, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, uh, as reported by his sister, Mona Simpson, he had, you know, he'd been suffering from um, cancer, abdo- ab- some type of abdominal area cancer. I think it was liver cancer. And he was, you know, semi-conscious largely unresponsive. And then he opened his eyes just moments before he died, big eyes open and said, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Now we call that a terminally lucid event because he He didn't. Yeah, he was comatose. And then he died soon after that. So terminal lucidity is confusing because if you don't know about it, uh, it looks like, hey, the person's recovering. They're getting over their cancer. They're coming back to life. But in fact, it's a harbinger for death uh, coming shortly. So, yeah, that's a good one. And then the one you talk about, Betty White, is that her caregiver reported that Betty opened her eyes moments before she died. And she was largely unresponsive. And she called out the name to her partner, life partner for many years, whose name I can't remember. Alan. Alan, that's correct. Alan. Um, and, and that's a terminally lucid event because as the caregiver says, like, you know, she hadn't done any communication with anybody. And yet then she opens her eyes and she goes, Alan, Alan, and she's engaging with them. So the interpretation for terminal lucidity is that you're peering beyond the veil. And in Steve Jobs case, he was looking at something clearly amazing and, and gave voice to it. And in Betty White's case, it seemed like um, her, life partner, Alan, was there to greet her and meet her, which we often see. And the shared death experience, which comes, you know, well, if you follow the map of this right after, uh, if this person dies and Betty White dies, well, it's very likely that she's going to be greeted by Alan and other uh, departed loved ones. And we see that in the shared death experience. There's a lot of corroboration in these experiences. And then if you go to the flip side, if you will, of after death experiences, we have a lot of Post, we call it direct post death communication. Uh, that's when the, a loved one, a bereaved loved one, feels like they're asking, you know, that the, 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 the departed loved one is in their mind hearing their thoughts and questions and will often answer questions they didn't even know they were asking. Things can be as trivial as where to sit the relatives at the funeral or what kind of flowers to get to the funeral or what should I wear to the funeral? I mean, when you start hearing this as a researcher, you're like, holy moly, why do these people care so much about the funeral? Um, and they're giving instructions. The other one is um, post-death visions and visitations. And that's where you feel you, you know, typically you are in your room in a quiet place. And all of a sudden you see your departed loved one appear at the foot of your bed. 
and they'd come to you and they say something like, just wanted to let you know I'm okay. Uh, hope you're well, love you. And g- often give a little hint or instruction about something like, hey, you might want to uh, take that job or- Buy, buy like- Apple buy Apple at $7. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That type of thing. Um, yeah, those are the main ones we see there. Alex, so that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty, that's, that's amazingly remarkable. What I, what yeah. I love what you've done is that you've, you've gone into this as a, a researcher, as a, yeah. as, as, as a, almost a scientist, if you will, in the way that you're approaching cataloging these experiences yeah. and giving a framework to, that's right. which really never had frameworks before i mean look i've heard of you know my grandparents would talk about things like you know when oh my sister died i you know i woke up in the middle of the night and she was at my bedside or you know smiling at me or something like that and you hear these things as you're a kid and you're just like oh okay and grandma's yeah grandma's been hitting the whiskey again uh (laughs) you know or something as uh, those kind of things or you know someone dies and you have a dream of them dying but you didn't know that they were dead yet. Yeah. And you're like, you wake up in the morning, you're like, I think auntie died or something along those lines. Uh, There was a really, I'll tell you one, this was a really strange one. I think you'll be very interested in this. Yeah. My aunt who I adored passed about a year and change ago, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. And, you know, I got to see her probably about three, four months earlier, I got to actually see her again. And I hadn't been in Florida in a decade. And I got to see her and I showed her my kids and all that stuff on the phone. And when she passed, a few days later, this is so weird. I was doing a project where I was going through old videotapes for a, for a project I was working on. And all of a sudden, while I was playing back an old VHS, there was a three minute scene that I forgot that existed, but then I vaguely remember shooting, which was a Thanksgiving scene at my father's house with all of my family around a lot of, a lot of the family on that side of the family around. And there she was young, you know, in her probably in her fifties, early sixties, no, yeah, probably even younger than that, probably in her fifties. And she was there. And I just found it so odd that basically two to three days later, this video came up. And then I shared that video with my family who there was really no footage of her in existence other than this magical three minutes that was sitting in a VHS in a box of work which I didn't even know was there. I was just scanning through the VHS and there she was. I was like, how in God's green earth did that happen? Yeah. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Cause that's a really, that was for me, even then I'm like, man, that seems the timing yeah. is a little off. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we call, you know, a synchronicity when you as the experiencer says, wait a minute, I, this is far beyond chance. This is just not coincidental. It seems like, I was guided here. Or there's some force at play that is manifesting this experience for me that is meaningful to me and to my yeah. family and is healing. Yeah, we see that quite a bit. I have to say, as a researcher, you hear like a few dozen of those cases and you go like, OK, there's a lot of chance here. But people like to believe that there's, you know, that there's something meaningful behind this. But now after I've heard, you know, a thousand plus of these, I'm like, no, these are these are events far beyond chance, far beyond coincidence, far beyond probability, and they're inherently meaningful to people. So that, I encourage you. That's what I found so wonderful about it. It was that it was a wonderful way of almost saying goodbye to her. And yeah. and for my family, like my father and whatever relatives are left that know her, when I sent it out on a text and an email, people were like crying, like, Oh my God, look at her. Like, I can't believe that that was, and it was my grandmother was there. She had passed on years earlier. Like it was this whole family thing, but it was three minutes. Cause yeah. I was, I was, I was practicing a new camera that I had bought 
in 90, whatever, 92 or 90, 93 or 94 or something like that. And it, I truly never even knew it existed. It was so far gone. And it just popped up two or three days after she passes. I was like, no, 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 no. This is, this is way too coincidental for me because yeah. there would be no reason in the world for me to even look into that box. Yeah. A, v- a VHS. Seriously. I don't even, <laughs> I didn't have a VH. I was doing a project. I had to go buy a VHS deck, bring it in to watch some of these old VHSs that I had because I was doing some, some work on it, but it just, it was just the timing was so off on it. So I just yeah. found it interesting. It's, and that's something very recent that happened. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I would completely affirm you, not just because, you know, I want to affirm you. I think it's in the research. We have people that sheepishly, you know, almost with a sense of shame, say, you know, I had this experience. And uh, I mean, I, I think it, it's pretty random. It's really meaningful. But am I making this up? Am I trying to make more of this than is? And we say, you know, I say clinically, absolutely not. You're a reasonable person. You live your life. You know how things go in this world. If it falls out, you know, outside the bell curve, then you know that it's a special event, you know, and there's probably some force coordinating it. Can I prove that? No, but I can do it with the research. I can say, you know, thousands of people have these experiences and they feel just like you. Um, from all you walks know? of life, from all walks of life, from all, all walks of life, every, every religion, every community, every uh, yeah. everything, every every kind of tribe in the world. Goes you got it. This. Now, can you tell me what the shared crossing project is? Yeah. So uh, I started the Share Crossing Project in 2013. And the goal was to positively transform people's relationship to death and dying and end of life through raising awareness, essentially educating people about these profound end of life experiences that we've just been discussing. These, you know, these experiences that are inherently meaningful, spiritual. Granted, they're far out to the mainstream, but my goal, as you identified, it was to give a very research-based structural framework so that rational, reasonable people could see that these experiences happen, that they're valid, and that they are, they contribute, and I think the highest way, to a best end of life possible. Like they really help people have good deaths um, and learn things that we've already identified in the after effects that will ease their grief, that will uh, let them know that their loved ones are alive and well somewhere. Um, And then the second aspect of our mission, Share Crossing Project, which is always really important to me, um, I mean, in terms of something that I just thought was imperative, was to bring people together in community to talk about these experiences. Because when you start hearing other people talk about them, you know, when, you know, Susie, who, you know, works at the post office or the library comes in and you see her every day and you, she shares her experience with her, you know, mother when she died and she has this shared death experience. And you're like, wow, hey, if Susie had them, it's kind of funny. It sounds similar to what we had when, you know, so-and-so died. It's like, okay, so you bring these people together and you start realizing, these experiences happen all over the place and, and they do, and they do. Can I tell you how, what's, can I tell you what's the frequency and what portion of the population have them? No, but I can tell you that they are far more common than, um, than the general public knows. Now I'm going to ask you two questions. I ask all my guests, what is your mission in this life? Well, I think my mission in this life is um, is twofold at, at the level of kind of work and contribution um, to the common good. It's to, uh, you know, I just said it's my mission is a share crossing project to help people come into relationship with death and dying through through learning about these experiences so they can have better end of lives and realize that we're human beings here now. We're spiritual beings and we're having a human experience and that. All we can tell from the research is that we survive this human life and go on to a, a beautiful afterlife. And, uh, and that's my work. That's my work life. But I also have my own personal 
uh, responsibilities. I have a loving daughter and um, really committed to being the best father I can be for her. And um, my friends and community and family relationships are very important to me. And in those relationships, I, I think I learned the virtues, at least I try to practice them of patience, of kindness, of caring. Uh, I think that's the other part of that kind of the, the side of my personal growth side, if you will, developing those virtues, which I will say for me as a hardworking guy, and I do much better at the work than I do at the, at the, the level of, like, I find I can be pretty, you know, irritable and cranky at times. And so that's, I have to work on that too. So. And you know. what is the ultimate purpose of life? Well, I think the ultimate purpose is to uh, elevate, if you will, your soul spirit. I think there's something about this place. It's a school. It's like a a, a, a multi-level, uh, layered, if you will, university of sorts. And people come here. We incarnate and get our own personal curriculums within the great university of human life. And, and that's the purpose is to learn, to grow, to become more loving, kind, aware. And, and this is, you know, this is a training ground for that. And I, and I, I mean, one thing that I I have to be careful about is some people think that I'm rather, um, how to say this, that I look at life a little too lightly. Like, like I, some of my close friends will say, you know, you don't really, you don't really seem to be concerned about dying. And like, you don't, you know, I said, well, not really. No. I mean, I want to live as long as I can healthily and while in service, but I don't have a sense. I mean, put, you know, I have a sense that this is not the end all at all. I mean, mm-hmm. I feel like this is a part of the journey not the destination. And in some, you know, and you know, I'm a Buddhist practitioner and I believe that, that this life has a good deal of suffering in it. And I think this is a, a relatively hard realm. Look around. Oh, it's rough. <laughs> it's rough. I mean, come on now. This is, you know, you, you have to be out of your gourd to think that this is a, a heavenly realm. I mean, there's a lot of beauty here. There's a lot oh, of, it can be blissful, but those it are, can be, yeah. Yeah, but and and you can go into deeper philosophical conversations of allowing the external to affect the internal, and if you find bliss within yourself, and you, I mean, I'm sure Buddha, as he walked enlightened through the through the earth, he he a lot of the external did not affect him as much as it does to normal people, and and not normal people, people who haven't been enlightened yet, and so on and so forth. So there's a larger philosophical conversation, but I understand what you're saying completely. I mean, look, we've all gone through stuff. Yeah, uh, we've all gone through trauma. We've all yeah. gone through some sort of suffering. Uh, some suffer more than others. Some yeah. are more aware of things than others. It is a journey. It's a process. We're all walking a path and we all have our, I love the word individual curriculums because yeah. we truly do. And I, I personally do believe that the earth, the, the, the universe is a kind universe and that whatever is pushing you on the path that you need to walk on is there for your benefit. And as you and I both have been around the block a few times, you start looking back at your life and going, what was what I thought was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me at that moment? Actually, really, I'm very grateful for it because it completely yeah. made me who I am and it guided me through this, or I lost that job and I got this job and you know all this kind of stuff. So um, yeah. it's a fascinating conversation. It is. And I, and I um, yeah, I mean... And, you know, even, you know, like it's kind of, you know, I lived in Central and South America in some pretty hard places. One of the biggest teachings for me there was that most of the people that I was, quote unquote, there to help and serve were happier than me (laughs) and most of my contemporaries in the United States of America. I you wouldn't look that way if you took a photo. But I think there was, you know, in compared material life circumstances. But I, I just think we have to be very careful about how we rank and sort and look at people's individual curriculums. I, you know, I, I remember giving a talk. Um, well, actually, I was at a workshop, but it was a talk within a re- workshop. 
And I said, I was doing, I do a lot of guided visualizations in my work with people as I prepare them for a healthy end of lives and prepare them. I say, prepare you for a conscious, connected and loving end of life experience with a lot of these shared crossing experiences so that you can have them. But I was teaching, a, guiding people through a, a review of their life and they had, you know, they were imagining being dead and they were reviewing their life. And I was asking them to look at what had they accomplished in their life? What were the things they were most proud of? And some woman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I was a, I, I grew up poor and I married and I ended up, you know, having two kids with disabilities. And that's my whole life. I took care of those kids. And, you know, my husband and I, we loved each other. And she goes, but, you know, I hear you say accomplished in your life. I don't, it's, it's really difficult for me to hear because, you know, I see you doing your teaching and I, some other people in this group have made major contributions to science or, you know, big jobs. He said, I've just been a housewife just doing the best I could to care for my two disabled kids. I stopped and I looked at her and I said, that is the most beautiful curriculum for this life that one of the most beautiful I've ever heard. Like you're telling me that you came here, you grew up poor, you married, and you, you know, you had the fate, destiny, whatever, to have two disabled kids and you cared for them through your through their lives. And wow, what an amazing opportunity. I can only imagine that you develop patience, kindness, empathy, yeah. empathy compassion um, and all the difficult conversations I imagine you had with your, with your husband about what was the best way to be with them, how to allocate resources, all of that. She goes, yeah. I said, wow, congratulations. You know, you, 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 you've lived a full life. So I say that because I wanted to be really careful about, you know, not all here to, you know, solve cancer or be Gandhi or Martin Luther King. I mean, most of us, are living pretty, you know, Important. basic lives. You know, they may look boring on the outside in a certain way. And even the, even the, you know, the nine to fivers, which is so many people are it's like, you know, well, it, you know, are you, are you kind to your, your work, your fellow workers are, you know, whatever. I mean, there are lots of circumstances, very individual curriculums. We have to be careful about judgment for ourselves uh, especially when you're listening to someone like me, you know, who's like, um, you know, author and da, 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 you know, I'm the first person to say, and people around me will say, you know, William works hard. He makes contributions, but you know, I'm the first guy to say, I've got a lot of stuff to work on. And um, you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And where can people find out more about you and the work you're doing and where to buy the book? Yeah. Thanks. So, you know, sharecrossing.com is uh my website, the website for my organization. And what I want to encourage people there on that website is there's a lot of free resources. And one of them is the story library that I've been trying to create for years and finally got it up just before uh, the end of 2021. And we have stories, video cases, essentially, of people sharing their shared death experiences. It's a great way for people to learn about these experiences firsthand from experiencers. There's no other library like it in the, that I've seen anywhere where you can see, you know, I think eight or nine we have up right now. We'll be adding more. So that's just a great resource. And, you know, you can also follow us on, you know, Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram. And I try to provide good material there too. A lot of uh, our interviews and videos and things like that, just good stuff. We just, it's just not just, a, it's a community for sure, but I try to seed it with good information so that people can feel like they're going there and getting good information. And the book, um, At Heaven's Door, at, I will say, that is the at the time I wrote that, which is not two years ago, but it published in January of 2022. It has really, I'll say, my favorite collection of shared death experiences with different relationships, different types of people. So good diversity, you know, mothers losing children and having SDEs with them, mother, you know, sons, uh, grown adults with parents, spouses, children dying. So it's a good. Uh, cross-reference of 
different deaths and all extremely spiritual and and inspiring so and that's an audio and in, in kindle and hardback and what have you so my friend thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for the work that you've been doing uh and helping the world with their with this process that we're all gonna have to go through at one point or another so i truly appreciate you my friend thank you so much Alex, thanks. Pleasure being with you. Really appreciate our conversation and your knowledge about this. That's just wonderful to see how you've had these experiences. Your questions were uh, inspiring to me to say, oh, wow, this is a real conversation. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey. And don't forget to subscribe.